Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. My name is Sean Fonts. I'm an advisory board member for the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy, and I am also a graduate of Boston College Law School. We are excited to present to you today our program called Disparate Impact in Urban Planning, Development, and Social Justice. <clears throat> this program continues our series of programs for this semester that focus on race and social justice. Our th theme for the semester is equality, inequality, equity, and inequity. Racial disparate impact and social justice and how these concepts play out in urban planning and development throughout the city of Boston and nationwide is today's focus. To navigate these topics and these concepts, we are fortunate to have for you a panel of some of the most notable and knowledgeable academics and professionals in the world of urban planning and development in Boston. These panelists are, uh, furthest to my right, Harley Atien, who is a associate professor of urban and regional planning for the University of Michigan, Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. We also have next to Harley, Ted Landsmark, a distinguished professor and director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy, which is housed at Northeastern University. And Mr. Landsmark is also a member of the Boston Planning and Development Agency Board. <clears throat> Next to Mr. Landsmark is Kathleen McNeil. She is a principal at MP Boston the local office of Millennium Partners, which is an urban real, real, <coughs> real estate developer. And then last but definitely not least, we have Angie Liu, who is executive director of the Asian Community Development Corporation, which is a nonprofit community development and affordable housing advocacy organization. However, before we go further into this program, there are a few important people that I would like to thank and acknowledge for bringing this program to you today. I would like to thank and acknowledge Phyllis and Jerry Rappaport, the founders of the Rappaport Center. I want to thank Dan Canstrom, the center's faculty director and academic brain behind the center's programming. I want to thank former Massachusetts State Attorney General Scott Hoshbarger, the chair and leader of the center's advisory board. And last, and again, definitely not least, I want to thank Lissy Medvedal, the center's executive director, and Cindy Wynn, the center's assistant. They are the center's engine and instruments by which these programs are brought to you. <clears throat> So just a little bit about the format that you can expect today. I will begin with a brief in introduction of the topic uh, to set the focus and set the table for what we are going to be discussing today. And then I will turn the floor over to the panelists and ask them a series of questions on the topic today. And then we will close out with questions from the audience. And hopefully we will end on time at 1.30. <clears throat> to bring us to the inspiration for this program, we need to rewind back to December of 2017, when the investigative journalist arm of the Boston Globe, called the Spotlight Team, published a statement that reverberated around the country. That statement was, quote unquote, the median net worth for non-immigrant African American households in the greater Boston region is $8. This statement was being contrasted to the $247,500 in household median net worth held by white Bostonians. The Spotlight team in making this statement was relying upon a report by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Turns out that this jarring statement was the point of ground zero from where the Spotlight team would explore racism in Boston 
and the condition of African Americans who have confronted a deep and painful history of racism in Boston. With notable moments such as the busing protest of the 1970s. In fact, as a testament to how esteemed today's panel is, one of our panelists happens to be a central figure in a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph that helped to document the, Bo the Boston busing protest. This person is Mr. Landsmark. And again, you will hear from him later. <laughs> In exploring the condition of African Americans in Boston, the Spotlight team did a seven-part series which touched upon multiple industry sectors in Boston, from the sports industry to urban planning and development, which again is the topic for today. In exploring urban planning and development, the, spot, the Spotlight team wrote an article titled, A Brand New Boston, Even Whiter Than the Old. This article used Boston's newest and most luxurious neighborhood called the Seaport Neighborhood as a case study for exploring racial disparity in urban planning and development. As a bit of background about the Seaport Neighborhood, it is a thousand acre land area geographically located in the south of Boston, considered part of South Boston and went through the height of its current development over the last 20 years, resulting in a neighborhood that today houses premier corporations such as the drug manufacturer Vertex. It also houses luxury retail, luxury homes, apartments, restaurants, and bars. The Seaport neighborhood is an appropriate topic for exploring racial disparity impact and social justice because the planning and development of this neighborhood contains all of the fundamental ingredients that go into these topics that we're going to explore today. This is because 20 years ago, the seaport was a decaying industrial area with rotting train tracks and wharves. However, city planners envisioned this neighborhood could be a fresh start for Boston, where $18 billion of public money was supposed to create a seaside neighborhood for all Bostonians, including African Americans. However, what the seaport ultimately became was one of, quote unquote, the whitest neighborhoods in the city of Boston, actually cutting out African Americans from housing, wealth opportunities, and social life. This program and this panel of experts are going to explore what urban planning and development means from a theoretical and practical standpoint. We will also explore the racial disparate impacts that became evident through the planning and development of the seaport. And then we will explore solutions and the potential for urban planning and development to be an actual tool for social justice. With that being said, I'd like to turn to our uh, first uh, panelist, uh, Harvey, Har Harley. And what I want to ask you is to introduce yourself to the audience. And in introducing yourself to the audience, I would like for you to explain a little bit about, about what you do, particularly with respect to urban planning and development. And in, and in introducing yourself, I would like for each of you to tell us what your gut reactions were after reading this Spotlight article titled, A Brand, a brand New Boston Even Whiter Than the Old. <clears throat> so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm a, a Boston native, actually. Um, and I've lived away from Boston for 30 years. I actually went to high school with Sean um, way, way, way back in the day. Um, but that uh, helps inform my perspective on this issue about Seaport and um, um, even going back to that famous photo, which I remember when I was a child. Um, so I teach urban planning at the University of Michigan, and a lot of my focus has been on community revitalization um, and how to actually bring social justice to the core of what urban planners do. Um, urban planning is this very strange field that people don't understand, um, but it's all around us. It organizes um, human settlements and, and our society um, in every imaginable way, from sidewalks, setbacks and homes, the height of your fence, um, to developments like Seaport. Um, there is inherently a power, a, urban planning is politics. 
Um, it's not just um, this regulatory scheme. Um, and so as one way of introducing myself, um, ironically, when I was invited to do this, I don't think that the organizers understood. Um, I'm actually on sabbatical right now, and I'm a law student too. Um, I'm actually um, missing constitutional law right now. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm earning a one-year degree at Yale um, on my sabbatical um, because um, after earning tenure at Michigan, thank you God, um, I decided that I really wanted to take this hard turn towards social justice um, and using the power of legal analysis to actually ratchet things up um, within the field of planning. Um, and so I'll just kind of skip to my reaction to the article. Um, as a native Bostonian, I'm like, of course. Um, why would anyone be surprised by this? Um, as an academic, um, yeah, let's actually look at the data a little bit more carefully. Um, but my, my bigger reaction is I think the story missed something in understanding the, larger, the longer trajectory of change in the, Boston, in the city of Boston and the Boston region and the movement of poverty um, around the city and out to the suburbs and to places like New Hampshire and Rhode Island, um, Fall River, um, Worcester, that to not understand that movement of poverty um, is missing half of the picture. Um, that this isn't just about what happened at Seaport, um, success or failure, but it's about a larger story of inclusion um, of Boston's minority neighborhoods and workforce um, from the high-tech industries, pharmaceutical industries, other things that have emerged over the past 40 years. Um, and then that's really, that's in, in many ways the story, that it's not just that things have become unaffordable or are unaffordable in this one place, um, but that we really have to talk about um, how people have access to the dominant industries um, in the Boston area and whether or not they can afford to take part um, in what gets designed and developed. Thank you. And Mr. Landsmark. Um, how many of you are law students? Terrific. Okay. so. Um, I have degrees in law and environmental design uh, from Yale and uh, my PhD uh, from Boston University. It's a pleasure for me to um, be here and, and I would start with one um, fundamental bottom line for law students in particular and that is that um, as much as your clients will uh, expect you and pay you uh, to deliver to them uh, an answer to some problem they uh, present you with, um, I, I've learned over the years that you also have an obligation uh, to um, help them understand and project what the uh, negative uh, or unanticipated uh, outcomes may be of pursuing a particular course. Um, and uh, that is certainly uh, one of the key factors that has affected um, the uh, disparate uh, outcomes in uh, the waterfront um, and also uh, the larger uh, set of uh, planning issues in the greater Boston area. I have to start uh, by saying I lived in the Fort Point Channel uh, area in one of the warehouse offices about 30 years ago when there were nearly a thousand artists living there illegally. Um, and we were tolerated by the city because we were uh, filling space uh, for the landlord in a way that was keeping the buildings intact um, and from burning. And uh, none of us uh, anticipated uh, that the kind of development which has emerged uh, in that neighborhood um, would in fact emerge. But we all knew that the time was going to come where we as urban pioneers would get kicked out of the area. Um, and, and of course we did. Um, I then had the opportunity to work uh, in the Flint administration uh, during um, Merrill administration, um, during uh, a time when we had great hopes for uh, programs uh, that uh, the city wanted to run, after school programs and nurses in schools and uh, a range of other social service programs. But Boston's a very weird city um, and, and the weirdness of that city um, uh, helped to drive the outcome in the waterfront. The city proper of 650,000 people uh, is one quarter the size of the population of Brooklyn. And the population of the entire region within 128 is about the population of Brooklyn. Um, and so when one 
talks about Brooklyn, when one talks about Boston, one has to understand that it is a very small geographic area where its revenue base is largely dominated by not-for-profit organizations, universities, churches, government buildings. And so as city administrators, and I worked very closely with the mayor on this, we looked around and we thought to ourselves, how are we gonna pay for these programs um, that would benefit uh, the majority of people in the city? Um, and I can tell you that um, the city treasurer, the mayor, and others looked at the waterfront area, the seaport area, um, and we looked at what our current revenue stream was at that time. The city does not have a city income tax. Uh, it does not have uh, money that comes in from the MBTA. We looked around and we realized that the only thing that we could do to generate more revenue for social service programs was in effect to create new land. And we looked at the waterfront and we saw that the waterfront in fact presented the opportunity to create that new land. And this will sound cynical, um, but it, it's part of the real set of decisions that policymakers end up making. We wanted new land that would not create significant new demand for human and social services when that new land was created. So we knew that the kind of development that had to go in there would include large-scale corporate work and either rentals or condominiums for wealthy people who would pay high taxes on their units and not demand new schools, new libraries, new support systems. And that's what the seaport became. It is a revenue generator that now uh, provides the funding that has given Boston six straight years of AAA bond rating, new schools throughout the neighborhoods, new libraries being built, and almost no demand from the residents and workers in that area for new social services. So we, in effect, created a money machine without creating new demand on services. So now I sit on the BPDA board, and I'll get to some of the implications of that. But there's no question but that in the regulatory powers that we have, we have had internal significant discussions about the consequences of creating a kind of housing that excludes affordable units. This, this is not an unanticipated outcome. It is a conscious decision that was made. And it was a conscious decision that was made with the understanding that developers, private developers in the area would build, would be required to set money aside in a separate fund that would then make it possible to develop roughly 20% more units than if they built those units in the waterfront. And it has generated, among other things, over the course of the past five years, um, about 30,000 units, almost 30,000 units, of new housing units across uh, the city. And of those, roughly 6,000 are affordable units, or at least affordable on paper. So, it, it will seem cynical that, in fact, the seaport was developed the way it was, but it was developed the way it was with an intended outcome of generating revenue for the city that it could not generate through any other sources. Thank you, Mr. Land <coughs> Mr. Landmark. And Mrs. McNeil, yeah, thank please you, Ted. introduce that's, yourself. And that's a lot of food for thought. Um, so as was mentioned in the introduction, I work for a private real estate developer, Millennium Partners. We're national. Uh, we develop in most of the major cities around the country. I represent the Boston office, and I've only worked in Boston my entire career, which spans over 30 years. I'm one of those luxury developers. 
Uh, we have not built affordable housing. We have written the check um, until this latest project that I'm involved in, which we can get, get into a little bit further. Um, but as a somewhat minority, as a woman in what has traditionally been an all white man's world, I have seen firsthand how you know you have to really be deliberate and intentional about what you want to achieve. And I think at the seaport, maybe we weren't intentional. My um, company bid on Frank McCourt's land, which was one of the very first um, land parcels out there that triggered the development. And we lost. But I can honestly tell you the conversation was not about uh, disparity or inclusion. The conversation, as Mr. Landmark, as um, Ted, Ted Landmark mentioned, was about uh, financial gain, about developing an area of the city that was underutilized, and it was about jump-starting that part. Flash forward to 2019, when we're bidding on a city-owned parcel that was a decrepit garage, the conversation was about inclusion. It became part of the conversation of who was going to be awarded that particular piece of property. It forced my company and me personally to look at what we were, we were doing and look at how we were doing business. And OK, for 30 years, the city of Boston had things like workforce goals. But it never had goals for the soft side of development. It never had goals to have partners um, that were perhaps underrepresented parts of the population. It never had goals for architects or engineers to participate in the process. So for the first time in Boston's development history, we're having those conversations and we're being intentional about um, those kind of disparities. So in a way, the first solution to any problem is to acknowledge you have a problem. And I'm, I, you know, I think the city has finally done that. And I will say, um, and I don't want to take Angie's thunder away, but we also decided we've got to stop writing checks for affordable housing and we have to build it. And so we um, were very creative in a program where we partnered it up with, with Asian CDC because, as I said, we're luxury developers. We don't know how to do affordable housing. I'm not going to pretend that I do. So we go to the experts that do. And um, I'm very excited that we are working together to develop, what are we at, 160 odd units? Yeah, it's up to 171. OK, yeah. so, so great. With that, I'll, I'll <laughs> let Angie talk. But. And this is Lou. All right, um, so I'm Angie Liu. I'm the executive director of the Asian Community Development Corporation. It's, I know it's a mouthful, so we like to call ourselves ACDC, like the band. <laughs> um, so we are a 30-odd-plus-year uh, um, nonprofit that's uh, based in Chinatown. Um, but these days, we also do work out in Quincy and Malden as well because we serve primarily lower income Asian American populations. Um, so a little bit about my background, how I come to this work. My background is in urban planning and um, community development of former housing. So previously I had worked in both Seattle and Philadelphia. I'm, uh, I'm probably a newcomer to Boston on this panel because I've only been in Boston for seven years. Um, so, um, at ACDC, um, a lot of our work is really rooted in giving back the power of planning and development and participation back to the community residents. And in our case, those residents are not only low income, many of them are recent first generation immigrants who uh, may speak a little to no English. So the barriers to participation, um, whether it's to a zoning board meeting or a BPDA meeting, um, let alone understanding the notices for those meetings, uh, those barriers become much higher. Um, so that's really the root of our work. Um, so over the course of our history of three decades, we have built a couple hundred uh, units of affordable housing, um, primarily in Chinatown. And most of that work uh, ha has happened on publicly owned land where 
Um, like Kathy said, if the public agencies are really intentional about promoting certain priorities, such as high percentage of affordable housing, job opportunities, they can put those requirements in. And so we have been successful in mobilizing resident and grassroots power to compel um, the public agencies to do that. And in exchange, we have been able to leverage that uh, into several really transformative um, mixed income, mixed use projects that have a whole array of tiers of affordability um, for residents to be able to stay um, and live in Chinatown. I'm not gonna get too much into it, but as you probably all are aware, um, the greater Boston region uh, has, you know, is experiencing an, un, an uh, unprecedented uh, wave of gentrification pressures throughout many of the neighborhoods, and Chinatown is at, uh, at one of the epicenters of that. So I'll stop right there. Okay, um, thank you. And since you guys are using first names with each other, can I use first names? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Harley, um, first question to you, and you touched upon it in, in your introduction, but I want to back up and just make sure that this is clear. From an academic standpoint, um, an academic who studies these concepts, can you tell our audience what does, what does it mean, urban planning and development from an academic standpoint? Sure. So. Uh, I would divide, I would separate urban planning from urban development. Those are not the same things. And so all urban development is urban planning, but all urban planning isn't development. So, you know, it's, it's one of these weird kind of conundrums. So I would separate them very much. And so a city or government can regulate land uses and um, how dense housing can be, where commercial property should be, et cetera. That's very different from the private interests of a developer who's trying to build housing or commercial real estate for a profit. Um, so as a public urban planner is going to be very interested in making sure that there's a common wheel. Um, and so we want to have a separation of land uses, and it doesn't have to be Euclidean in its sense, and I know we're using a lot of jargon up here, but it doesn't have to be, you know, I don't want to live next to a slaughterhouse, for example. Um, and so the city should have some way of controlling that kind of nuisance near my home. I don't want to live next to a roller coaster or what have you. And so there are, and there are cities like Houston where there is no urban planning, um, and that you do have a situation where someone's living next to a roller coaster. Um, you can have that happen. Um, but it's really the public's, you know, kind of the government, the state's um, interest to do this. But developers have a different, I'm not kind of trying to cast developers as evil or, or bad. I'm just saying that at, 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 you know, at the end, they're looking for how can I use kind of available possible, you know, options to create a profit. I mean, that's the goal. Um, and so there has to be some way to kind of actually set some bounds so that a profit motive doesn't actually become a nuisance to other people. So we often say the most quickest and easiest definition for urban planning is highest and best use of land. And so whether that's transportation, schools, that we have this highest and best use. And so um, as lawyers and someone who's studying the law myself, um, you become critical in that <coughs> process in understanding conveyance. And so if you're, I don't know if, if one else take a property in the first semester, but um, do, people are not laughing, so I guess yes. Uh, so, <laughs> um, you know, conveyance and, you know, whether, you know, there's like that side of, of it, but then there's also, um, from a social justice perspective, do I have the right to stay in place? Um, and so do I get quiet enjoyment of my property and how can the state actually facilitate that? Um, and how developers, so you really want to see development as something that the city will partner with developers to make that happen, but developers are looking for profit and planners are looking more for the common wheel. So how can we distribute resources like parks, hospitals, schools, fire stations, um, highway access, all these, you know, all these different things that will actually make um, places livable. Um, and can I just go to the disparate impact? Um, yes, you, know, you, you, you beat me to okay. the punch. That was so, the next question. So, you know, and some of you, you know, probably have already covered disparate impact in class, but, um, you know, those of you who have kind of breezed by the Yik Wo case, I would encourage you to go back to it. Um, I know, it's like I'm, I'm there with you. I'm like, I'm serious, I'm right there with you. You know, um, you know, you think about Yik Wo, it's really like, so is the state acting in good faith um, in the way that it applies planning rules to say, um, are we just trying to kind of regulate, you know, kind of laundry services and making sure people aren't, you know, kind of burning down the city? Um, or are we actually targeting Chinese, you know, laundry services, like Chinese-owned laundry services? We could say the same thing for something like Seaport. And so was it exclusionary zoning? Was it disparate impact? Like, what was it? 
Um, was it intentional? So just to go back to the point that was made earlier. So um, we can have, so I would just add exclusionary zoning to this in that we can say that something is kind of on its face, just there's a disparate impact to how things are kind of rolling out, that we didn't mean to exclude people, but it happened, and so now what? But there's something to be said for exclusionary zoning and what that means that we're deliberately, um, in the way that we kind of zone something to say we don't want unrelated people living together, which would mean that you all wouldn't be able to live together as roommates in Brighton or Alston, or we're deliberately not putting in sidewalks because we don't want people to access uh, transit services, or we're deliberately not putting in multifamily housing. And so that can be a deliberate thing, and so trying to understand whether this is, uh, you know, kind of, Maybe developers doing this because they know they'll make more profit on kind of the very large, you know, kind of footprint homes um, or the very high-end, um, you know, condos. Or is it that the city's kind of a, a partner in that process to make sure that that doesn't happen? And how can the public actually hold planner, you know, the public planners responsible to make sure that they're not actually hurting the public in the way that they're zoning um, through exclusionary zoning? So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. Next question is for you. Uh, so the Boston Globe article did state that the Seaport neighborhood um, became uh, one of the city's whitest neighborhoods. And being that uh, you knew what was you know what was going on on the ground, from a practical standpoint, um, what does that mean to you? And you know, from your from your position, government and, and your position as a professional or architect, what does that whitest city whitest neighborhood? What does that mean? Well, I mean, clearly it's an opportunity lost uh, in terms of uh, uh, efforts made by, I would say, all of the recent mayors to overcome Boston's reputation um, as a, a racist city. It raises some very uh, challenging questions around how one goes about managing uh, racial diversity uh, in the context of a market-driven economy where you cannot mandate who ends up living uh, in the units uh, that might get built. We don't have the legal authority to do that. Um, and so uh, race and class and uh, uh, economic prosperity are inev inevitably intertwined with each other. And one can say, well, we, we could have uh, put more, uh, uh, tried to put more affordable housing, which then becomes kind of a metaphor for more people of color on the waterfront, but you can't mandate who ends up living in the housing that's being built. That's illegal. Um, and so that then raises a series of other questions um, about uh, the outcomes that you want and also about how you go about achieving those outcomes. And again, I go back to Boston's reputation um, as, as a, a racist city. Boston is racist to the same extent that most other major American cities are racist. And by that I mean, uh, Kathy can point to the number of people of color in the commercial real estate industry who have developed large-scale commercial buildings in Boston, in San Francisco, in New York, in Atlanta, um, in Dallas, the numbers of people of color involved in large-scale commercial real estate are negligible everywhere in America. And the number of real estate lawyers who work in this field are negligible everywhere in America. We can look around this classroom, the number of Latinx and African American lawyers is negligible, and the number of black and Latino architects everywhere in America is negligible, and the number of people working at large pharmaceutical companies that move into areas such as, this, as the seaport is negligible, and the number of people of color working in the financial services industries that have long dominated the waterfront area, negligible. So one can look at the seaport and Boston and talk about what could have been 
but you cannot divorce that question from the related question of how and why the industries that dominate that area are themselves intrinsically racist. And one then has to ask, why does that happen? And how does that then become epitomized in the numbers that we see on the Boston waterfront? Because you will find those same numbers in the developments on the Brooklyn waterfront. You'll find those same numbers in anything that you see developed in Dallas or San Francisco or Los Angeles or anywhere else in the United States where professions have long been dominated essentially by white men who have not opened the doors to women and people of color. Can I, can I just add wow. something very quickly? I just want to put a fine point, I, I am in complete agreement, um, but I, I think one statistic is useful. Licensed architects in the U.S., 2% African American. 1% um, Latino. Um, planners, certified planners, 3%. Um, that this is not an exaggeration to say that it's a small negligible number. That it is actually, we're talking not single digits, low single digit percentages. It is actually that small. Yeah. Okay. So instead of you asking me a question, can I address sure. what Mr. Landmark said? Because it's really interesting and it is all true. But rather than talk about what it is, we, me, as a developer, decided it's time to change it. So what can we do? So I have a project in the financial district that's large enough. It's a billion three. It's a million six square feet. So we have enough critical mass that we can do something different. We can try to be a change. Also in the city of Boston, Millennium is somewhat of a leader. Um, we save the city from the hole in the ground with Filene, so we can, you know, we tout that we're, we're good, we're <laughs> leaders, we're going to change the world. Um, but then we have to be intentional about that. So when we moved forward with the Winter Center project, we said, okay, we're going to meet not only the city workforce goals, which were new goals that were higher than were set before, which I didn't have to do because my project was approved under the old rules, but I said, nope, I'm going to go for the new rules because I want to be intentional and I want to send a message to my team as a leader that this is as important as budget, as schedule, as everything else we're doing. Then we said, okay, we're going to take all of the soft costs and we're going to make sure that there is a percentage of those um, contracts that go to minorities and women-owned businesses. So then we went out and we looked for them in their slim pickings. Um, and I think one of the issues about real estate and why it's been slow to change is it's a relationship-based industry. It's not an industry that you go to law school and you pass the bar exam and that they, you know, different industries recruit 25 of you every year. It's not. You get in because your father owned land in the city of Boston for years and years and now he wants, you know, you to develop it uh, because your grandfather, you know, was a, was a major developer. So it's that kind of industry, and we decided to be um, shake it up a bit. So we have now started to generate relationships with some minority firms. We have had some tough times. We've had some good times. We absolutely, I can tell you, had to spend a lot of time getting to know each other. And time is money, so that's been a challenge for me. But it has become important. So you put the time in, you get to know the firms, you help grow them. So that's been one platform that sounds small, but when there's only two or three percent architectural firms, um, to send that message, to send, you know, that somebody in this room might decide to go out on their own and develop a law firm because they heard that there's opportunities. That was what it was about. It was about creating opportunities and opening some doors. Tag McClory is in the back of the room. Hi, Tag. Uh, Tag was a real estate broker at CBRE. Uh, he's a person of color. He's been on our teams. Tag said, you know, I want to do something different. I want to um, be part of the change. So we have recently been working with Tag and the law firm of Choate Hall, and we're setting up uh, inclusion in the capital structure of the real estate deal. 
So that really speaks to building wealth. We will make a lot of money on our projects. We generally do. Well, sometimes they fail, and then you make it on the second go around. But sooner or later, somebody makes money on real estate. So how can we help um, equalize that money? And how can we bring people into the industry that don't normally have that opportunity because their father didn't own the land, because they don't have a relationship with J.P. Morgan? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we are trying something new with Tags Help, and we are trying to develop um, a, a mezzanine structure where we want to raise about 20 million from um, people of people of underrepresented groups, primarily within the city. We will go outside the city, but we think there's people within the city that we can give this opportunity to. So. I, I don't know if it's going to work, but we're going to try it. And what that will do is I'm hoping that that will become a model. And on, Massport has done this very intentionally. They actually have equity partners. This isn't quite equity. Um, we don't generally, as an organization, take on equity partners. So this is a little bit of a hybrid on this. But I think it's a model that could be replicated. And I think it's an opportunity for people to earn returns of you know maybe, what are we, what are we talking about for returns, Tag? Six to ten, so better than your CD in the bank. Okay, so and and most and this money is no, unlike equity. This money is not at risk for the most part. It it's going to get paid back. So we'll see. It's a small change. It's a small way to say let's create some opportunities. Let's um, give some doors for people. All right, Kathy. Thank you. You you answered a uh, question I was going to pose. So so Angie, shifting shifting a bit here. So there was some reference um, made earlier to uh, special housing funds that developers uh, can, can contribute to and, and also um, um, build, can, uh, developers can um, build in less expensive neighborhoods. And my understanding is that uh, the work that you do in the agency uh, uh, that, that you lead uh, uses um, this fund. Can you explain to the audience a little bit further um, sure. What these what these policies are, what these funds are, and how do you use them in sure. practice? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, and Kathy's also expert in this, so so feel free to jump in if I'm explaining things wrong. Um, so, in the example of the seaport, um, you have commercial developments and then some housing developments. So, in a city of Boston, there are two similar but different policies apply to res residential and versus commercial projects. So if you're a developer, oh, sorry. If you're a developer building more than 10 units of housing and you need some sort of zoning variance, and a lot of projects do, because um, zoning has actually, uh, for the most part in the city, has not been updated for many years. Um, then you have to uh, include a certain percentage of um, inclusionary units. So those are the affordable units, right? And so historically that percentage has been about 15%. And you could either build them on site or you could choose to pay into a fund. So for the, a very long time under uh, the former mayor, Menino, that formula was $200,000 a unit. And so I think this is what was referenced in the article that um, majority of residential developers chose to pay out into the fund as opposed to building those affordable units on site within their luxury projects because the construction and development costs um, in Boston have risen uh, dramatically so that um, it probably takes um, these days more than double $200,000. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm even just thinking about the affordable units that we do. Right. It, um, this, think about this figure. I'm gonna give you this figure, okay? It's uh, roughly, it costs roughly half a million dollars, half a million dollars all in to develop a single affordable unit in Boston, half a million dollars. Okay, and so for, for um, market rate development, it could be even pricier. So $200,000 doesn't get you very far, but if, if I was a developer, I'm gonna go the route that's the most cost effective for me. 
hell yeah, I'm going to pay the $200,000 if there's no um, policy compelling me to do the other thing, right? Um, and then for commercial buildings of a certain size, they also have to pay a fee called the linkage fee. That also goes towards um, housing as well as neighborhood jobs. Um, so since they're not doing housing on site, that also goes into a fund. And for many years, there has been widespread criticism of how um, formerly known as BRA, the Boston Redevelopment Authority, how there was very little transparency um, to the outside world of it, it just exactly how the BRA was collecting those funds from all these developments. So it was only much later on that people found out that um, depending on what projects you were doing, different developers um, got deals cut and maybe were not all complying with whether the inclusionary development or the linkage policies. So I'm going to focus on the inclusionary policy because that's more on the residential side. Um, that policy got tweaked at the end of 2015 under the current mayor. Um, so he tweaked it. What he did was he both raised the payout amount. If you want to pay out um, now for what's called Zone A, which is you know downtown, Seaport, Back Bay, those areas, you will have to pay out $380,000 um, per unit. Um, and there's also more incentive for developers to build on site. Um, or there is a third option, which is what Kathy was referring to, which is the third option is what we're to get, doing together, is the developer to satisfy that requirement. They can um, work directly with another developer that's doing affordable housing and create the required square footage or number of units that they have to do directly. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, you know, that's uh, MP Boston and ACDC are working together. We're taking their, basically their money from their Winthrop Garage project and put it into a really big project in Chinatown that's going to create, you know, up to 171 units of affordable housing. Now, let me just make one other point. So I think um, from a urban planning community development perspective, and I actually talk a lot about this with my other community development colleagues across the city in different neighborhoods. I know in South Boston, they have a very strong preference for compelling developers, large and small, to put their units on site so that they have those units right within South Boston as opposed to going into a fund in a city and not really having control as to where that money is then given out, right? I mean, Kathy made the reference that in the past, you always just paid, paid out, but you couldn't track where your dollars were going to. You couldn't say that was going to that project in Roxbury or Mattapan or Dorchester. You couldn't trace that money. Um, on the flip side, on a community development side, at least in Chinatown, in some cases, I actually prefer that payout money, especially now the formula is higher, okay? And I'll tell you why. Because we rely on subsidies um, from both the city and state heavily to create those affordable units. Like I said, remember their half a million dollar figure? Half a million dollar figure um, and uh, to create one single unit and we want to rent it to you know, families who are making you know, 30, 40, $50,000 a year. That's a huge subsidy gap that needs to be made of somewhere. So that money, um, a, a, a huge boost has been these um, linkage and IDP dollars from the city. The other thing to keep in mind is that if a developer was doing these affordable units on site, if the the income requirement is not that low, actually. So um, they are uh, restricted to people who make moderate incomes. And in the technical parlance, that's you know 70 to 80% area median income. And because the area median income in Boston is actually really high, 
So you have situations where we have families in Chinatown who are working, you know, both parents are working, you know, two jobs, you know, in restaurants or hotel service and whatnot. They can't afford to qualify in any of these so-called affordable units in, in these buildings. Whereas um, the affordable housing that um, a CDC like ours develop, we actually take that money and we, um, you know, couple other subsidies from a state and, and you know, operating subsidies, we lower the affordability um, levels a, a lot. So that we have units where families making you know thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars can actually afford. So from you know so that there's that perspective that sometimes I do appreciate the payout if um, it, if it's enough. I think you need both formulas. Yeah. It costs me a million dollars to build a unit. So if I were building on site, it's still going to cost me that million dollars because of my land cost, <laughs> etc. On Angie's site because it was a city policy working together, that site is a ground lease. So we don't have an upfront land payment. So she can build her units for a half million dollars and she can take my money and build more units and serve more people at a lower AMI than people that would come into my building. So that particular answer to me from a social justice standpoint makes sense you know, to be able to build a lot more units. And Kathy, the other just, thing we're I'm doing. Sorry, just sorry. to follow up, yeah. just, just for the audience. And what is AMI? So uh, average mean income. So I think in the city of Boston, it's is it's, it's yeah. area median income. Yeah. So what yeah. what is that number like sixty thousand or? I, I, yeah, I think it's like high sixty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. And that's so I mean, it's you you person. have to, you're working. Yeah. You're, you yeah. have a job. Um, the other thing I think that's exciting with Angie's project, project is we are able to offer some for sale units. And again, that's building wealth. That's getting in and instead of putting money to rent, you're actually putting money toward your own equity. Um, so I find that that whole formula is a much better outcome than building you know, 15 units uh, as part of the Winter Center project. Now we can get 171 units. And, and just one uh, footnote on the seven dollars uh, or eight dollars versus uh, two hundred forty-seven thousand dollars. The, the disparity between uh, the average uh, African American family and the average uh, white family in the Greater Boston area that is made up almost entirely of the value of home ownership. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the white families own a home; the black families do not. Uh, there are complex and, and very disturbing reasons why uh, black families don't own their own homes in Boston and racism over the years and, and redlining, uh, all supported by lawyers who drafted documents, um, uh, have, have kept African Americans and Latinx individuals out of the home ownership market in the greater Boston area. And that's gone on for 70, 80 years or more, right? So the difference between $8 and $247 is in home ownership. And the way you have to begin to overcome that is through a set of initiatives that make it easier for people of color in Boston to own their own homes. The problem with that, in part, is you. And by that I mean, as long as we have so many colleges generating graduates who want to stay in this area and have professional careers, to the extent that new graduates each year outrun the supply of housing that is available, rents and housing costs increase. And so part of the challenge that we have is one of figuring out how we continue to absorb new people as professionals. It means the city has grown by 50,000 people over the last six years. How do we absorb all of the people coming out of our colleges, driving up rents and housing costs? At the same time, we want to protect those people who already live in our communities. And we haven't solved that yet. Arlie, I see your hand, but 
I, well, in a sense, it's, uh, well, I want okay. to respond to that okay. I mean, and then actually just take it a little bit, you know, go further with it because I think we're going here anyway. I mean, I think, so I think, you know, for those of you who came to this and are like, okay, this is a social justice panel, like, like we're talking AMI and formulas and payouts, like, oh my God, this sounds like a real estate panel. Um, <laughs> you know, it is a real estate panel, and, you know, and I think there, there's a place where, you know, in some of the courses that I teach at Michigan, you know, I attract a lot of law lawyers actually to my class, which is why I'm in law school. Um, but some of this is actually about the details of the law. It actually is about understanding the city regulations and understanding these formulas. Like, so it's not just, okay, let's go to City Hall and yell at the mayor for like, getting X wrong. Um, some of it actually is understanding how AMI works and how these formulas work to actually benefit communities that actually need assistance. Um, without understanding city regula regulations and how to kind of actually you know, kind of use them for the benefit of community, vulnerable communities, it actually doesn't work. And it's not just about kind of yelling at the mayor or city council for not doing something. It is about understanding the law and the regulations to kind of use them uh, in a beneficial way. Now on the college front, so you know, um, I, think, I, I think Ted's absolutely right. This is about kind of thinking about the supply of housing and you know, what Boston area colleges are doing in terms of how we can absorb and kind of retain talent here in Boston. The problem is, one of the problems here is that Boston Area Colleges, a Boston Globe article a few years ago, maybe a year or two ago, about how diversity at Boston Area Colleges has barely budged over 30 years. So, you know, so if you want to diversify Boston, so, you know, we were going to go to the, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead to, nope, Atlanta, you know, to Atlanta, you know, you know, thinking about one of the questions that we, you know, prepared questions was about the comparison between Boston and Atlanta. Well, Atlanta is, you know, in many ways, this is reverse great migration. African Americans were leaving places like New York and Chicago and Boston and going back to the South, and they're not going to small cities. They're going to Charlotte, they're going to Atlanta, they're going to Houston. And in some ways, it's a magnet, not just for black people from the Northeast and the Midwest, but also from all the HBCUs um, around the South. And so I wanted this agglomeration economy. I want to be where all the other cool black people are. Um, and I'm sorry, no offense, you know, I'm a Bostonian too, they're not here, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean a couple, you know, but, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, but, you know, but not enough, you know, of an agglomeration, like, okay, yeah, like, it's, it's on and popping in Boston, like, where do I get my hair cut, like, what do I do? You know, I mean, and that's a real thing. So if I can't, I mean, so it's, it's you know, it's thinking about the formulas and the administrative, you know, administrative law that kind of is the side of this, but then there's this other part of like, okay, where's Harvard and MIT and BC and BU um, and all and the North other, East Northeastern, I'm sorry, and Northeastern in kind of actually thinking about, you know, kind of bringing in, making their campuses more diverse, much more diverse than they were 30 years ago, and they, they've not done well on this, and then retaining those people in the Boston area. So the experience that people have in places like some of the people of color that I'm seeing here, if you're having a bad time in Boston, you're like, okay, the minute BC graduation is over, I'm out of here. Um, and I get that, you know, and so some of this is about how do we actually retain you and then get you to think about this kind of, I mean, we're steeped in it, so it's, so, it's not minutia to us, but it might be minutia to you, because it's like, I just want to talk about social justice. Well, but this is one way to do it, is to actually understand how these things actually work and really dig in there um, into this administrative law. That sounds really boring, but in many ways isn't, because that, you know, you talk about 160 units, that sounds like a really small number. It's huge. It's actually, it's actually significant. Yeah. And you say law, I mean, we are talking about inclusionary development policy. It's a policy, it's not yeah. a law. Right, you right, know, right. Interestingly enough, it's. Right. Okay. Thank you, Holly. So uh, just to, just, just from a time check standpoint, I'm gonna ask one more question of the panel, and then I wanna give you, the audience, an opportunity to ask questions of the panel. So, Harley, there was a lot of, there was, there was a lot of discussion previously about Professionals having yeah. having people of color professionals come into uh, come into the profession and and developers and and others feeling that there are no people of color there are not many people of color uh, in the profession. So with that being said, and as an academic and Ted, you're an academic also, so feel free feel free to chime into this. Um, what do you think that the academic community can do oh my to God. help? fill this pipeline and ensure that we have people of color, professionals in this space? Well, I mean, there's a lot of things. And, you know, I don't know BC law, so, you know, I can't speak to what's happening here. But I'll, I'll, and I'm not going to criticize, you know, Michigan planning or, or anything else. And so I think there's one of the, the best planning program, hands down, is across the river. MIT planning is amazing. So I don't know if you guys have any consortium agreements with them. If you can, get over there and take a class. 
um, understand what AMI is, understand what zoning is, understand what, how some of these things actually interact with the law. I mean, I think the law is really wonderful and powerful, but it should be law and. Um, there should be some connection to something else. And so understanding some of this kind of actually site, like how do you actually implement the law? It's not this abstract thing. There, I mean, those of you going into corporate law, you know, God bless, and you know, have fun. Um, you know, I mean, it's not a judgment, it's just, you know, you're going. Uh, you know, but <laughs> there's, you know. But and understand how many hours of, uh, uh, how many billable hours you need a year. But yeah, go on. Yeah, I mean, I think some of this is, you know, and one of the things that I love about urban planning is like, let's get out there, let's get on the red line, let's go to Mattapan and understand what's going on down there. So you can go online, you can kind of look at the, the census data and kind of like, okay, yeah, I get it. You know, Haitian community, blah, 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 yeah. Can yeah. I add a plug of the book, Color of Law? Yes, yep, it's Color of Law. All about history of redlining. History of redlining and how the government really was complicit in this. I mean, read some of these books and read some, and take classes with professors who, you know, advertisement, you know, take classes with people who are actually critically assessing this stuff and think about how you can apply the, attach the law to something like real estate um, or to social work or to think, uh, economics. The law really, and I know this is a big thing here at BC Laws, it is at Yale, you have to have that connection to economics. If you don't understand kind of statistics, you don't understand how economics works, you're at a real disadvantage um, because you're gonna be up against people who understand this much better and are gonna be running circles around you um, with median and modes and you know distributions and um, they can, they can put all sorts of things into contracts that you're not going to understand. So I would say really find ways to kind of connect this and I think work with the faculty who understand that and are going to push you to kind of add that law and something um, to what you're doing. I, and I would say two things. BC used to have, and maybe still does, a wonderful program for um, bringing uh, uh, kids of color primarily from Boston neighborhoods onto this campus. Uh, during the summer and, and during the school year, um, you ought to connect to those because part of the challenge that I certainly faced as a kid growing up in the projects in East Harlem was I never met a lawyer. I never met a real estate developer. Um, I never met any of the kinds of professionals I ultimately became. And that exposure really needs to start in middle school, not you know, waiting until high school, not waiting until, you know, some one-off uh, when sh someone shows up at a, at a college. It really needs to start earlier. And the, the colleges and universities can play a major role in, in that regard. I remind everyone at Northeastern that Northeastern is in Roxbury mm -hmm. um, and, and that we have an obligation to do outreach. The second thing I would say is, uh, I would assume that as law students, many of you live off campus. And uh, one of the things I've realized as I've watched my own neighborhood in Jamaica Plain change is that students have a tendency to isolate themselves from the communities within which they live until their car needs to be jump-started or until, <laughs> right? Or, or until their garbage bin doesn't get taken in and then they get to know their neighbors. You're an asset to the city, and you're an asset to young people who will never otherwise meet someone like you unless you make yourselves available to those young people so that they can aspire to be in this room. And I think that universities can play a role in facilitating those kinds of informal connections in a way that then drives folks into the pipelines uh, in a way that ultimately they become all of us. Okay, thank you. Now with that, we are going to open up the questions to the audience. Um, we have microphones that could be brought to you. Um, all I ask is that if you do have a question, please stand up so the microphone could be brought to you. Does anyone have a question? Yes, lady in the back. Um, Kathleen, um, it, in your remarks, you made the point about the, the lack of, of minority professionals. And um, I think one of the reasons that we don't have my, my, more minorities in professions is because our education system has not made um, the education of minority students what it should be. So my question to you is, uh, do you see Millennium 
having any role with respect to the education of the children in Boston so that they can have the foundation that they need to be able to go to professional schools? I think that's exactly right. Um, it's slim pickings, and I think it partly starts by at the kitchen table. Ted mentioned he didn't meet a real estate developer in his youth. Well, now we're lucky we have a president that's a real estate developer, we all. <laughs> uh, couldn't miss that one. Uh, but you're, you know, one of the things that Millennium is doing is um, we engaged Bill Moran. He's a neighborhood community former teacher. And we're trying to talk to youth about what the opportunities are. Because many people don't understand that there's a job called a real estate attorney or a real estate broker or an architect. Because when they sit around the kitchen table, you know, their family, their mom goes to work at Brigham and Women. So, you know, they're nursing or they're healthcare, but they haven't been exposed to this world of what it takes to be part of the built environment. So I will say that although we are only one organization, um, we are working very hard because I believe, like one of my panelists said, this starts at mi in middle school. I wanted to become an architect in middle school. Um, my father did not want me to go to Boston to go to college. He said, you're, you have University of Lowell right down the street, you're going there. I said, no, I'm not. I had my paper route and I found a way to go to Boston. Um, so I think, Yes, we have to bring that exposure, and then we have to bring funds. Personally, I just recently, as having become aware, like really just in my consciousness of the disparity, I set up a scholarship at Wentworth, which is also in Roxbury, which is my alma mater, uh, for women and for minorities to study the built environment. So yeah, Millennium has to do stuff. The community has to do stuff. Um, we have to just be thoughtful about it. There's a program called CREST, which is Commercial Real Estate Success Training, and it's being funded by ULI and NAOP and a lot of the local real estate groups. And they're taking not middle-aged students, but they're taking <coughs> college students and they're giving them internships in real estate programs so that young college students can be exposed to what real estate is. It's finance, it's law, it's architecture, it's politics. You know, it's a broad spectrum. And you might not get that opportunity to be exposed to those careers if it weren't for these internships. Um, so little by little, uh, it's probably not enough, but it's little by little. And, and Kathy, what is, I'm, I'm sorry, just, just a yes. clarification. Kathy, can you explain to the audience what UI, ULI is an acronym for? Oh, I'm sorry, ULI is Urban Land Institute. And NAOP is the National Association of Office and Industrial Parks. And I think the industry in general um, has said, we know we have disparity and we need to fix it. So they're starting to be conscious about it and they're starting to take some steps on how can you know, we as an industry improve this. Yeah. Thank you. And I, then, yeah, I just want to add, add to um, the previous remarks about how can we bring more people of color um, into these professional industries, I think. Exposure is huge, but I think some of, the, some of the issues is that, you know, a lot of the people who are getting into these, you know, whether you're going to law school, planning school, or architecture school, a lot of times you're the first gen, first gen in your family to go to college or first gen your family to go to grad school for advanced degrees. And there are lots of things that I think, you know, whiter, wealthier families take for granted that um, are not intuitive for these uh, young people, whether they're students, grad students, or even just young professionals starting out. I mean, even in the community development field, we constantly talk about how do we build a pipeline of leaders, of people of color, and how do we retain them in the field? So it's all of those things. And one of the things I would stress in you know, institutions is internships, but paid internships. At ACDC, we have a high school youth program, and what I see is a lot of the, um, you know, high school kids in our programs, they'll choose a paid job working at a public tea shop because they need the money during the summer, as opposed to going to 
an unpaid internship at some prestigious you know, investment bank or a law firm that would give them the exposure, but it is unpaid. So their wealthier friends living in Lexington and Conquer can afford that and have that exposure, but they can't afford that. So that's huge. The other thing that I will add is in terms of networking, going to those you know, mainstream networking events, you know, like the Urban Land Institute, NAOP, whatever, mainstream networking associations, that's important. They, I think equally important is for people of color and you know, first gen in these industries is also having um, your own sort of affinity groups because you can talk about issues that your common peers understand that other people might not. And at least in the community development field, we find that's been immensely helpful. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, this is concerning the, the potential of rent control in, in the region and in Boston. I know that um, part of what has happened with the increase in rents, especially in the seaport, is that the rents have gone up all across the city of Boston. and so in a place like Hyde Park or Mattapan, we're seeing rents at $2,400. It's also because, as, as uh, Ted Lansmark has said, because of the people in this room who are graduate students driving up the prices, that's a Boston Foundation report showed us that. So my question is whether or not, given the successes in California, for folks who may or may not know, just passed a rent control law for the whole state, uh, there's a real cry for rent control here in Boston. And I'm wondering if, if the uh, panelists can address uh, Ted Landsmark or the others as to whether or not there's an appetite uh, for rent control. I know that the city of Boston uh, city council is looking at rent control, but we know how hard it is to get it through the legislature. So part of the question is, what do we think about that? Where do we think that's going in, in uh, the development field here in Boston, kind of here and now? There's certainly an appetite for rent control among tenants. I've heard no appetite for rent control um, as among uh, building owners and uh, developers um, for the obvious reason that um, as long as you're controlling rent at a particular level and your expenses continue to increase at a different level, uh, the incentive to maintain property uh, is diminished with rent control. I mean, I, I know rent control from New York when I was growing up. It feels great. It gets sometimes manipulated by people who have a rent controlled unit who can then pass it along as happened for a long time on the Upper West Side and in other neighborhoods. But there isn't an appetite, and as you well know, there was a referendum on this a number of years ago in Massachusetts, and strangely enough, it was defeated. Uh, my sense is, I think it's great that you're declaring victory for the new uh, uh, law in California, but I think it's a little premature to do that. Um, I think that rent control could work as long as you don't have a steadily and strongly increasing demand for property. But as long as more and more people are coming into the marketplace who can afford the higher rents, uh, rent control doesn't meet the supply issue in a way that then uh, holds rents down. Okay. I saw our hand. Uh, I'm curious about what made Millennium decide to be good. <laughs> good question. It's a good question, and that's a good way to phrase it. I think we've, we've always been good. I mean, there's been reference to, okay, big developers go for profit. We do go for profit, but we care about our neighborhoods, partly because our neighborhoods are, in, are, are investment. We generally participate in any, um, you know, things that are good for the community because that's where our investment is. So if it's good for the community, it's going to be good for our investment. When we did the Winthrop Center project, we had to change the shadow law. And we needed help from not just downtown Boston. We needed help from Boston as a whole. And people from the communities who wanted jobs 
and who wanted to see the project go forward because it was dense, there was density, and part of the solution to lack of housing and such is to open up some density. I'm not saying that anybody wants density in their backyards, but there's some areas in the city that can handle the density and this particular site could. So we wanted that, we needed help from the community, we got the help from the community and we promised them in exchange for that we would do some uh, bold initiatives that might change the needle, that might, you know, long term, we're only one project, but my goal and our company goal is long term that we create models that other developers can use, that we show the city that, you know what, you can do this and it can happen and it can happen productively. So um, that's why we decided to be good, because people were good to us. All right, one more question. Hi, thank you. You mentioned Atlanta. I was wondering if you could talk about other cities around the country that have maybe done things better than Boston and what Boston could le learn from them substantively. Sure, sure. I don't know if I can point to one and say better. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a complex thing in terms of, if we're talking inclusionary zoning, um, that's a tough thing. So I often look to Minneapolis um, for, I think Minneapolis has done many things right. Um, so one thing that Minneapolis has recently done um, is that they have actually, um, they've passed a law that basically no new single detached housing. Um, Seattle has passed something similar. Um, that seems scary to people. Um, but a lot of people, particularly in the affordable housing circles, are pressuring cities to think about upzoning. Um, that one of the hardest things for affordability is this kind of obsession with single family detached housing. Um, and that it's expensive, um, not just for the owners, it's also expensive for cities and regions to maintain. I mean, if everyone's living on a quarter acre lot, um, the transit has to go further. We, you know, the postman has to, the post worker has to go further to deliver the mail. All of everything gets more expensive. And so there's something to be said for um, at least thinking about some of these things like accessory dwelling units um, and kind of breaking up this idea, this paradigm that all of us get a quarter acre lot and kind of 3,000 square feet um, because that's probably not helpful. Um, and that we have to think about different forms of housing tenure, not just condos, but lots of different things. And I think Minneapolis is, and Seattle are two cities that are pushing the needle. Now, whether there's a racial, you know, we can see some like a, a difference in disparate impact, eh, you know, that, that remains to be seen. We'll, we'll see in the next 10 years. Yeah, as academics, we're constantly looking for models that have been tested. I mean, there are a lot of great initiatives right now, but do they really work to address uh, issues of racial disparities? The fact is, we don't know yet. Um, and, and many of the people in this room uh, will be helping, helping to shape some policies that, that may affect that. But the reality is, uh, apart from Minneapolis and a little bit in, in Seattle, you look around the country and there are not a lot of cities that have solved this problem. New York hasn't, Chicago hasn't, Atlanta hasn't, Dallas hasn't, uh, 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 Salt Lake City hasn't, uh, Portland hasn't. Um, everyone's talking about it, but very few people are actually in a position to say that, that, that they have really addressed this. In Boston, I'll just say, Boston has, has achieved a distinction in a number of areas, right? We have the most accessible parks of any major city in America. Quality of life is great. But we are also still the most racially segregated city in America in terms of where people live. And it's partly because of the way we're broken up politically and the way real estate has been passed down or not. Uh, but there are very few cities in America, unfortunately, that are exemplars of having addressed issues of racial disparity. <laughs> and with that answer, that concludes our program. It's 1.30. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> and, and, and I urge you to go to the website for the Rappaport Center to see future programming. Thank you.